Welcome to Draft Sickos on the No Ceilings NBA podcast feed and YouTube channel. This is the show where we cover everybody from the biggest of names to the deepest of sleepers. I am your host, Maxwell Baumbach, and today I am joined by an NBA scouting consultant. His name is Garrett Johnson. Garrett, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How about yourself? It's great to be on the show. Yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure to have you on. You're a guy who's, uh, whose work I've always really enjoyed and enjoy chopping it up and talking draft with you and excited to do it on this show so today we are going to be talking about some some postseason standouts let's call it because we're going to touch on some nit guys too uh but there are guys that we aren't going to see for a while uh until either the combine or the nba season perhaps uh depending on where they kind of fall in the pecking order of things um these are guys that had kind of big finales to their season and we're also going to talk a little bit about some guys that just had great outings that are that are still competing out there so the first guys that we wanted to get into talking about this was the Colorado prospects. Um, Cody Williams is a guy that a lot of people have talked about, so we're not going to spend as much time on him. Uh, but we are going to talk about Tristan De Silva and KJ Simpson because they both had some really big games down the stretch here. Let's touch on De Silva first because he's a guy where he's. I wrote in the in the Mark Madness kind of preview piece. He's always been a reasonable selection in that like. 20 to 45 range where it's just like he's tall he can shoot he's got a little bit of feel like just just really solid at a lot of things with nba length um i've seen a lot more like he should be a mid first round pick kind of stuff um about De silva he had 20 points on 11 shots in their first game in the second game 17 points four rebounds five assists um really showed off some good cutting i thought in those games a little bit more at the passing and just the basic recognition against defenses, finding those open players. Um, good, good for his four showing against Boise state, good showing against Florida. Um, they are, they're still competing. They're still in the mix here. Uh, but what have you seen out of De Silva and Simpson? Yeah. So first of all, their game against Florida was one of my favorite games. of the whole tournament, mm-hmm. I don't know yeah. how you couldn't enjoy just like that constant up-tempo offense, plenty of transition, but it was well-executed transition, well-executed up-tempo offense. I mean, both defenses, while, you know, neither team's really known for that, especially with Florida now missing hand locked in. Yeah. Uh, that both defenses got eviscerated. You have to acknowledge that, but I mean, the offensive execution for both sides was immaculate. And, you know, for Colorado, it's a two-man game that leads that. When you have KJ Simpson clicking, when you have Tristan De Silva clicking, then the rest of the team clicks. And, and both of them were just on the top of their game against Florida in particular. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they've really been on a tear for a few weeks now with the Pac-12 tournament as well. So, yeah, really awesome to see. Uh, you know, with De Silva, I've been following him for a few years now. His brother is Oscar De Silva, former mm-hmm. first-team All-Pac-12 Pac- guy. Uh, so that got him on my radar immediately when he looked like a more athletic version of his brother who had athletic limitations that he's now playing in Spain. Uh, Much more interior oriented. uh, Yeah. More of a post up guy, more of an undersized power forward kind of guy uh, wins with strength more than like the ball skills that uh, that Tristan has. And for me, I had him as a late first round pick going into the end of last year. He tested temporarily and it was never really a full test. He withdrew pretty quietly. I don't think a lot of people even knew that he tested. Um, but he's been an outstanding shooter for a while now, and that's got you know obvious NBA value to it. When you're six nine, have a solid release point. You know your your shot selection is always neat. Uh, you can count on him to make right decisions in the offense. And you know in this game, he was just his shot making was all over. He was hitting shots from multiple levels. Uh, I think the one thing that I've noticed in his game from last year, this year is that he's way more nimble on his feet driving to the rim. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a little bit more like, he looked a little bit more like his brother, like a more of a power forward style driving style last year. And, and this year he's, he just got better footwork and just seems to get to the rim a lot more uh, smoothly. And it led yeah. to a couple buckets in this one. Yeah. There's definitely a little bit more like counter craft to his game too. Like, I, mm-hmm. One of my concerns with him has always been that, like, he is a really lanky body. So, like, when he attacks the basket, he, I don't know, like, his limbs are just, like, really long in a way that's not always great on offense. Like, on defense, it's great. Like, he's able to get in for digs. He's able to uh, contest really well in the perimeter. Like, there's all these benefits to it. But on offense, like, at times, he, he can be a little upright with the ball. He's easy to knock off his line when he's driving to drive to the basket. His handle gets high. Um 
where in in these games in the Boise game in particular like they have all these big kind of physical forwards I thought he showed a little bit more as far as like all right I'm going to step this way and then counter back the other way to get to the interior where in the past it was a lot of like I've been bumped I've picked up my dribble and now I have to pass out or I have to force a difficult shot in the mid-range where it is a more yeah true blue three level game at this point and he's he's kind of figured out how to work around the strength limitations a little bit and i do still think he's played a little bit tougher like i think he's done a little Mm -hmm. bit better with physicality this year than he did last year yeah i still think the rim finishing has some issues at times there's some times where you're like that wasn't the best finish that you could have gotten and i think part of it is that he knows his frames limitations he knows Mm -hmm. that he has to finish with more finesse than he does like powering through guys so you see sometimes where he'll finish like fading away from the basket rather than going to the to the rim, you know he'll 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 dunk on you. I mean he had this awesome transition run like around the five minute mark I think second half, where he just realized that he could put his man in a hostage dribble at half court. Yeah, and I he love just that play. and then he just like burst to the rim, took an open lane right down the lane, and and one hand dunked on everyone. Mm-hmm. It, it, that was a great play. He had another play in the first half where he weaved through a couple guys and had kind of a finesse finish, fading away from the rim like we talked about. So I don't think that game around the rim is necessarily his best. I mean, he does have – I did think last year when he had to – the Colorado offense was more stagnant last year where it was kind of like create your own offense, whereas this year there's been a lot more ball movement. Mm-hmm. Um, so you would see some of that post game that he probably got from playing with his brother growing up. And you haven't seen that as much this year because he's just so much more effective away from the basket, facing people up. Um, I, I loved this game from him. I, I liked that he was pushing transition consistently along with everyone else. You know, he doesn't, he's not a four man who once he, once he gets a rebound, looks for someone else to bring the ball up to dump off to, he will bring it up and he'll, he'll be effective with it more often than not. Um, but yeah, I'd like him to be a little bit more effective on cuts, um, and you know maybe be a bit, a little bit of a better finish at the rim. I do think those frame limitations are always going to be there. So, yeah, yeah, the frame limitations would be a lot easier to stomach if he was like a freshman, like if he was built like this at 18 instead of like a guy who's played at a high major program for four years with those kind of athletic resources at his disposal. Like it'd be a little bit easier to just be like, yeah, he'll he'll fill out, he'll get stronger, like. I do think he's gotten a little bit better as a finisher, a little bit stronger. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that's an issue. I think your point about the cutting is good too. I think it's, I think his timing shows up well at times, um, but because he's not like the fastest, which like there's just not a lot of six, nine guys that do this in general, but like, he's not one of those guys that can run hard off of an action and then like use his gravity to get back door on a guy. If they're like, playing super tight on him or like trying to top lock it like that's just not stuff that's like in his game um so he is gonna have to be a guy that like finds those cutting opportunities when they're there because he's not someone who's going to be able to create them through sheer force of will with his athletic tools like that's just not going to be a thing it's going to have to be timing catching your defender snoozing um that sort of thing um i i do think his decision making and passing is like a big standout difference uh yeah from the past couple years to this year like he was never a guy i would describe as poor field but he had like he had negative assist turnover issues every year before this one um or except his sophomore his sophomore year is positive but uh this year like it, it's just worlds different like he's seeing the floor so much better from the perimeter so much better from the mid post um and like you mentioned like that hostage dribble drive like i think that's just also indicative of like there's just a little more like pace and like ability to play at different speeds instead of like just this one fluid game all of the time. Uh, And I think that shows up in his passing a little bit too. Yeah. I think the ball doesn't sit in any Colorado players hands for too long anymore. Like I did last year is is a big thing. Part of that is I think just there was a team wide embracing of better ball movement from last season uh, I think the talent on the roster definitely facilitates that as well. It's it's a better roster than last year, but you just saw a lot of kind of like De Silva sitting on the on the block, sitting in the mid post, kind of trying to make a decision uh, for himself first, and then if he couldn't find something, he would look for a pass. Whereas this year, people are you're just looking around the floor, scanning the floor, looking for your best option at all times. Um, so it's really giving him a better his his assist numbers are raised because not only of a team context difference, but also just personally embracing that part of his game more. So mm-hmm. it's been nice to see those flashes. I, I there were those flashes were there last year, but much more far in between than the than now. 
Cool. So, yeah. So let's touch on just NBA projection for him real quick. Um, what type of player do you see him being at the next level? Cause I, I have a bit of an issue projecting like really high end outcomes for him. Like I don't see him as a starter because of those physical limitations. I think he has real issues with physicality on both sides of the floor too. We talked about the strength a little bit as it pertains to the finishing and the driving. Uh, but I think it shows up on defense too. Like he's a guy that's a little easier to move backwards than you'd like. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when he's facing against like real NBA fours, I think there's going to be nights where that's difficult for him. Um I see him as a guy who like you're hoping he carves out a nice role as like a sixth through eighth man knockdown shooter. I think there's a really nice floor on a guy that's that tall and can shoot like that and just doesn't make bad decisions, even with those physical limitations. Like I think that's going to keep a foot in the door for him. Uh, so I don't think he's a guy that like we look up in five years and he's out of the league. So I think for that reason, he's, he's probably got to be a first round pick. Um, do you see that sort of projection or do you think he's capable of, of maybe cracking like a starting spot on a, on a really good team? No, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. When when you're when you're a six nine guy who doesn't really defend that well in the post, but has all these scoring ability at every level, you really want him to beat those bench lineups pretty pretty solidly, rather than have him move up to the starting lineup and have his defensive concerns be more apparent when he's has less off- offensive usage next to you know better players. So for me, I would rather have him on a bench lineup, uh, beating up guys worse than him. And for me, I think that the defensive concerns are real, like you mentioned. I mean, you see it with like the way that he defends in the post. He's really good at breaking up entry passes, and I think that's partly because he knows that if he gets beat, if he gets the ball, and if the ball gets in there, he's beat. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I would rather have him beat up bench lineups, and you know, but if you're a really good six to eighth man, you got to be a first rounder. Yeah, and I yeah. think I think, I think the, the positive sure. outcomes for him are a really good six to eighth man, which makes it worthwhile in the first round. Yeah. And it's just one of those things where it's like, you don't get a lot of knockdown guys that are that tall. Like in the ones that you do get are usually like even less athletic than he is. And like, we're talking about like athletic concerns, power concerns and all that. But like compared to most guys that are that tall and shoot, you're, you're generally dealing with like a pretty diminishing athletic skill set a lot of the time. So um, let's talk about KJ Simpson. So you, you like KJ quite a bit. Um, and you were kind of, I, I, I've been like dragging my feet on him because I, I sure. have like all these small guard concerns, but as I mentioned to you kind of before we started, like he's got this really nice on off game offensively. I think he's pretty clever with some of his defensive rotations. I thought that just stood out in the Boise game in particular, like sort of knows where to be and like when he can cheat, took great care of the ball this season, knocked down his threes, can run some pick and roll more than capable playing without the ball in his hands. Um, I'm coming around to him. Um, mm-hmm. but I've, I've never had him in my first round. Like I, I just can't get there. You said that you would like consider that. Um, so walk me through kind of what you're seeing with KJ that, that has you a little bit more optimistic. Yeah. I think the first thing is I need to go out of my way to watch a bad game of his because every yeah, game yeah. I watch of his has been outstanding. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm, I, you know, with small guards, you have to really win me over at this point to get into the mm-hmm. first round. Uh, and KJ has done that so far, so that's why I need to complete the scout to 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 make sure I'm going to make this claim. But I think that he has a he has a claim for the first round, and part of it is just the completeness of his offensive game. Uh, like last year, way more foul drawing oriented. I think he still posts an outstanding free throw rate. Uh, but last year, just drawing fouls at will, uh, driving downhill at multiple at all levels of competition you know, ruthlessly effective and efficient, but he wasn't really much of a point guard. He, mm-hmm. he was, he's six, two, that's what he's listed at six, two. And, you know, he had way more scoring oriented mentality. Didn't really have great passing actually had a lot of kind of head scratching turnovers last year. And he's talked about actually in interviews about how coach just challenged him to be a point guard this year to really like promote this great ball ball movement that we're talking about from this tournament. And he fully embraced it. And unlike other combo guard, maybe like guys who are, have combo guard reputation, where once they move to point guard, you're they're not they're still not really a point guard. They're just trying to change their mentality a little bit. He actually has become a real point guard. His passing reads this year have been outstanding. Uh, he's really playing within the offense this year, but he can still take over games. I mean, he took over the end of that Florida game with two really clutch buckets. First, that really athletic up and under basket. Uh, where I think he got an and one. And then uh, he obviously had the buzzer beater, uh, Mm -hmm. Kawhi-esque 
Yeah, where it that bounced off the rim a couple bounce. times. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, very cool game for him. Yeah, I, I just think for him, it's like he's shooting 45% from three. He draws fouls. He's shown he's a passer now. He can score at multiple levels. He can play on and off the ball. To me, we're seeing someone become that consummate point guard that we need at the NBA level now where it's so competitive to get to play in the league at that height uh, that he brings so much already that it, he has a chance to to stick on a roster. And then he can, if he sticks on that roster, continue growing his game the, like he has and maybe reach some higher ceilings than we might have thought. For sure. And I, I really think one of the things I just love about his game is that you don't forget that he's on the court, which like last year there were games you wouldn't forget that he was on the court and like would not be for a great reason. Like he just mm-hmm. be kind of forcing it a lot and whatever, Rick this year, the way that he like just rebounds and like, I, I, I know that like, it's not the most fun thing to talk about is how well a guard performs on the defensive glass, but it is a pretty meaningful indicator. Like you just don't find a lot of guards that were, or anybody really that was like a poor rebounder in college that, that has a, a successful NBA career. He's a, a very above average positional rebounder that leads into his kind of leading to break. Um, I think his, we talked about the passing coming along. Like I, I refer to it as just like basic gravity recognition. I, I think yeah. is really solid. Like it, when he draws an extra defender, like that immediate, just like dump off pocket pass, like quick dish to, to the open man. If somebody, comes over to help is really solid and it's just something that has been a much more consistent element of his game this year uh the foul drawing you mentioned was a really big thing for him in these last couple of games like he has just been getting to the line like a maniac he he was there eight times in the con the conference game that they lost against oregon six against boise nine against florida uh today against marquette he did not get to the line um but yeah like that's that's been one of those things that has it's kind of popped up for him I think being able to do so much when you are a smaller guard is key because we're going to talk about it in a little bit. I think when small guards have bad games, it's just so much harder to make up ground and be a positive influence uh, for your team's result when things aren't clicking shooting wise. And KJ does enough that I think it can kind of like, if he goes through a prolonged slump, he's not going to be as out of the rotation as quickly as like a typical scoring oriented six, two guard might. Um, and I do think that goes a long way um, with your projection for him. Like for me, I, I just not a lot of like bench guards that are that height. So like, that's where it gets a little scary for me. It's like, I see him as a guy who like, will for sure hang around the league, but I see him more as like a deep rotation player. Um mm-hmm. Where do you think he kind of kind of ends up? So I think like if you went looked at like a str- like one of the really strong drafts of the decade, like twenty twenty one, I don't I think he's more maybe more of a second rounder in that kind of draft where the depth goes deep into the first round. I think this year, um, it's it's more of a nature of just trying to find guys who are going to make your rotation in that range. And for me, I want to take a guy who number one I I think can play in my rotation, and number two I think I can see pathways for him to get a lot better. I mean, I think it's more just refinement, continued refinement rather than having to add new skills to what he's already doing um, that can get him there. It's just how far can he refine these skills? How far can this craft go at his height? At, you know, he's a good athlete, but is he an outstanding athlete for the point guard position? Maybe not. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. you know, I think right now you're just hoping that he's a really high quality point uh, backup point guard who, you know, can get you some easy buckets makes the right decisions in the offense, facilitates things early on, and then maybe you start giving him more scoring responsibility a la Jalen Brunson in Dallas. Yeah, Um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think think one of my big things, like you mentioned, was um, some of those athletic limitations for him. And, like, I I think it shows up big time when he's around the basket. And, like, that's one of the things that freaks Mm -hmm. me out with him a little bit is, like, he just doesn't get up that well. And, like, he just feels so far below the rim. On yeah, the a lot of times that I'm just like, if if this finishing doesn't come along and like you've had one good shooting season and like I, I do by the shot, like he's always been a good free throw shooter. Um, I think it looks good, um, but it just becomes like a lot more daunting to like if you have to be this mid range and beyond type of shooter, like you really can't afford a slump then. Like if you're not going to be a rim pressure guy, cause he's like, he's both a good rim pressure guy and a good finisher at the college level. And I'm 
am just a little leery of how all that scales up. Yeah, my analog for him in the past, like say last year before he's added more to his game, was kind of a Scotty Pippen Jr. at Vanderbilt. Mm-hmm. Uh, just an incredible foul grifter. Uh, you know, it's it's a compliment. It's not an insult. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, you know, both score first guards who they both learn to be good distributors while they're in college. Uh, they're, they've got craft. They can score at multiple levels. But both of them had those size concerns. And we've seen I, – I thought maybe that was a reason to not – to discount uh, KJ Simpson because he had that kind of comparison in my mind. But, I mean, Scottie Pippen Jr. has been in Memphis now. I don't know if people have noticed – but he, he's been playing for Memphis, and he's been great. Mm-hmm. I think that he's probably going to make their final roster this year. And I think Simpson's probably gone ahead of him as a shooter, uh, as a passer. So I, I think there's that kind of avenue where you can kind of market to teams, hey, he can do this. He can do this role. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it starts at the end of your roster, sure. But give him a couple years, and maybe you can see him move into a larger offensive role down the line. All right. And then we want to touch on Walter Clayton real quick, just because he had an sure. awesome game against Colorado. Like he's a guy I don't think should go in this year. Like I think he absolutely needs to stay for one more season. Um, but six two guard, super powerful body, and just like showed what a takeover scorer he can be in that game with 33 points. And like it felt like 27 in a row, basically, at the end. <laughs> That's yeah. not the actual number, but he he was just getting bucket after bucket. Um He's a guy that shot like 45, 43, 95 at Iona last year. And it's been one of my favorite sleepers Crazy. for a while just because he has such a, like, like the ideal 6'2 guard body um, where mm-hmm. he can really get up. He's really physical. Um, I was really pleased with how all the defense scaled up uh, to the SEC level. I think the scoring was like good enough. I mean, he was Florida's leading scorer, which like is less than ideal for Florida, but I think is a testament to like he did really well as a scorer. Um, I think hopefully everyone else is a little bit better next year and he doesn't have to take on that big of a burden and he can prove more efficient. And I do think the game's going to slow down for him a little bit. He's his handles like whatever, like it's not great. Um, Mm. and he's a pretty basic passer, but I think if the game slows down for him against high major competition, like there's a real way for him to work himself into NBA conversations because I, 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 again, I, I think he's just awesome body for a small guard, awesome defender for a small guard, makes all these plays on defense, makes his presence known at all times, and can really, really shoot. Like, he is an awesome, awesome shooter. Um, And I think with one more year, everything will slow down a little bit. He'll kind of fill out the rest of his game. Do you have kind of a similar assessment with with Clayton? Yes, I did a really big deep dive on him before the season Mm -hmm. based off his Iona tape. And one thing that was concerning is, first of all, Iona really didn't play a whole lot of teams. I think they played no. UConn. UConn in the tournament was their first exposure to, I think, like a Ken Palm top 75 team. Mm-hmm. And they played a bunch of teams like 75 to 100. I ended up plotting it out, and he only shot something like 33% at the rim or something to that effect. He was like in a, those a games. strangely bad half-court finisher who also had a lot of dunks. Yeah, Like it was so those it, things where it's like, I, well, I don't know what this is. Yeah, he fixed his 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 numbers were really repaired by playing in the MAC, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, very concerned number like red flag for me. And then this year he's come out and he's been a much better finisher while scaling up to a higher level of competition. Just it felt a lot more seamless. It's still not a great number. I think it's about fifty five percent at the rim on the year, uh, but it's an improvement, uh, especially considering the strength of the competition compared to last. I mean the shooting's immaculate. I I don't think there's any more projection there beyond this is great. I love it. Uh, I, I, the announcer, who was the announcer? Was it was a Van Gundy who was just ripping into Colorado, not taking away his right hand the whole game. Yeah. Yeah. He is like super one handed as a driver. Yeah. So that was, a, that's definitely a thing. It's not just a, that, that isn't like a scouting note for the broadcast crew only. It's, it's a real thing that he's very right hand down. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd love to see him get, like you mentioned, go back to school and, and, get more comfortable using his left hand, at least left hand finishes at that minimum. Yeah. Even if you're not going to be a left hand driver. Uh, and the other thing is a lot of unforced turnovers. I, w- I would love to see him yeah. fit, clean that up. There's a lot of turnovers that you don't necessarily see from a real, like a true point guard, like a errant passes, losing his dribble on his own, dribbling off his foot, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. would love to see that kind of looseness to his game cleaned up a little bit. Cause I, by the shooting profile 100% and, and would love to see how his game grows. Yep, I'm right there with you. Let's move on to 
uh, kind of back to Colorado in a roundabout way with Nick Clifford, who was yeah. a guy who was at Colorado and is now at Colorado State. Um, real just kind of wild career trajectory. He, no kidding. Yeah, has like a very quiet freshman season as a sophomore. Like he's just this total stat cheat stuffer, but in like a 23 minute per game role has a pretty bad junior year. And then this year gets a big role at Colorado state does really well, has an awesome game against Virginia, 17 points, 10 rebounds and six assists just shows like the multitude of different ways that he can impact the game. This really clever passing game, this mid range pull up game, this finishing, this explosiveness at the rim, uh, defensive playmaking, uh, sharp ability to read the floor, uh, creative passing, like, just a lot of stuff in a six, six body. That is a big body. He's a thick dude, uh, but he doesn't move like it. He just moves like a normal guy that size. So really interesting prospect. I've kind of gone back and forth on Neek. I know Corey from our site loves Neek. Uh, what, what do you think of his game? Yeah, I'm going to go a step further. I think, you know, he has that bulk on his body. He's a great mover for that size. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he had a play. So I, just for notes for the audience, I'm a Virginia fan. I knew that game was coming from a mile away. I didn't watch. I couldn't I couldn't do it. I did watch his buckets, did see some of the highlights. Great game from him. But I went back and watched some other games ahead of this just to make sure I was up to date. Yeah. I don't play so, yeah. so I watched him play Utah State in particular. And I watched him run into a screen on the strong side, a design blindside screen that he runs right into stumbles. And I immediately go to my keyboard and start typing a note about it that he didn't see the screen. And then I look up and he is blocking a shot from the weak side wing after stumbling on the strong side. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how in the world did he get over there? And I had to go back and replay it and then make a completely different note than what I was writing before. Um, I think he's a great mover for, for his size and, and uh, height combination. Uh, that's the main thing that draws me immediately. I think at Colorado, like, for when you have a guy who's like last year uh statistical explosion doesn't match the previous three years it's always a red flag and you have to fi fi figure out the reason why it happened do you do you have mm -hmm. any inkling on why that might have happened um i don't know because i really liked him as a sophomore like i thought yeah. he was really interesting so i don't know if it was an injury thing a confidence thing i, I really don't no, and I didn't pay close enough attention to him to be like, oh yeah, it, like this was off or whatever. Like I, he was just I saw he had a slow start last year and he was just kind of off my radar. I just think that it might be that Colorado State's just using him better. I think sure. that Colorado yeah. State uh, is designing a lot more actions for him to get him into his comfort zone. I think when I was watching Colorado, we just talked about these passing advancements. He played on the team that was not a great passing team. And I think that, you know, so much of his game benefits from being able to threaten as a cutter. And, you know, he had a ton of highlights as a cutter at Colorado, but those highlights were over the course of a long season, not mm -hmm. necessarily getting a ton of opportunities game to game. So when he's not able to get into that rhythm, it leads to struggles, I think. So you have to wonder a little bit about the NBA level when he comes back to being, you know, the guy who isn't featured, is that going to be a problem again? Um, but I think Colorado State's gonna done a great job of bringing out his strengths and gives you that NBA window there where you can see how it could work. And I would certainly spend a draft like a late, late draft pick on him. To yeah, I love him in the second. That's that's kind of where I'm at with him. Is I I really like him in the second round. There's two things I kind of want to pick your brain about that have been like my hold up with him. The first is the shot because he has been mm -hmm. this super super up and down shooter. He was like a non shooter as a freshman, forty percent on low volume as a sophomore. Still lower volume as a junior, but 28%, then 37.6% this year. But like started really hot, went down to 32.8% in conference play. The first question I have for you is how do you think his game scales up if he's not like a league average or near league average three-point shooter? Like how much offensive value do you think he brings on that end if that's the case? Then we'll talk about the defense in a second. Um, well, I always think of value in the NBA as a spectrum where if you're not above average, you're below average. So it's not mm -hmm. an insult to him to say that I think that he wouldn't really be like providing positive value in the sense that mm -hmm. uh, there would be better players on the court if he can't threaten with his shot. Uh, but I think he brings a lot of value as a cutter, as I mentioned. Um, if he could just be a really highly active defender, that there's a 
a pathway there. But when you're at the end of the second and you have your kind of prospect pitch and one of those elements of that pitch don't work at the next level, it's going to be pretty tough. Yeah. Um, I do think he is fascinating to me because he is a guy where, like, again, he's just one of those players that does so much that it really is like sort of in everything but the shot predicament, like with how yeah. well he rebounds and passes and some of the stuff you can do defensively, like clearly physically and athletically up to the NBA task, which like with a lot of these second round guys, I think that gets uh, undervalued at times. It's like, Oh, these teams move on from these guys pretty quickly a lot of the time. And I think it can be valuable to just take a guy that like, you know, you don't have to wait on body development. <laughs> like sure. if they, they're just going to come in and be able to hang. Uh, I think that matters a lot. Uh, my next question for you is like, how do you think he stacks up defensively in the NBA? Because I think, the tools are really good. Mm -hmm. I think he gambles and cheats a lot. And like, I just were like, he does a lot of like the Matisse Tybal, like play behind the guy, like mm -hmm. let a guy beat you and try to poke it from behind. Like a lot of stuff where I'm just like, I don't know. I, like this is great in the mountain West. And mm -hmm. I just worry that a coach is going to rip his hair out if, if he sees this and, and that could kind of hurt him at the NBA level. But again, like I like the body. I think there's some real intelligence to his game maybe he just stops doing that at the NBA because he knows he can't get away with it. Like we've seen some of these guys that are good defensive playmakers that gamble a lot, either scale up successfully or successfully trim those things out of their game. Uh, do you think that's the case? Or do you think it's, it's a little bit concerning that he is sort of like almost fully playmaking oriented at times on defense? Yeah, I think it's tough to project it without seeing it. So uh, certainly there have been a lot of, I, I agree with your point. There have been a lot of players who change their mindset once they're playing upscale into a higher level of competition where they get burned a lot harder when they gamble. Um, but he definitely is a gambler, definitely a guy. I would like to see him have a little bit more play recognition rather than reactivity. That's something I always preach with defensive prospects in the NBA is the difference between a great college defender and a great NBA defender is proactively identifying what's going to happen rather than responding to it. And in his case, athletically overmatching who he's defending. Um, mm -hmm. So I would love to see him get a little bit more uh, proactive in his responding to the what the uh, offense gives him. Uh, but I think it's possible. It's in the realm of possibility. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. So uh, last one we're going to hit before the break here. We've had people asking about it a lot in the chat. The Kentucky guards. Uh, Kentucky had a really rough close to the season against Oakland. Uh, people, man, like, I hate to be the, like, preachy guy on the show, but, like, it really bums me out. Like, I, I feel like people are, like, really eager to, like, just slam whoever else, like, people have as their top guy on their board this year. And, like, Reed got oh, a lot yeah. of it, but, like, Reese Shea, I've seen Sar get it. Like, man, like, people are bloodthirsty this year. Uh, but a very, a very poor game from, uh, from Reed Shepard, like to be clear, he got benched, uh, down the stretch, uh, ended the game with three points on five shots, uh, four assists, two steals, two turnovers. Um, but Jack Olkey was just hitting shots in his face. Um, I think one thing that it raised a concern for me a, a little bit was just like, it's, it's just really tough to be super impactful when you're that size, if you're, if you're having an off game. Uh, I think that's something that I, I kind of factored in my evaluation already, but it was apparent here. Um, and then Rob Dillingham, like also had sort of a rough game. He had 10 points, but he was two for nine. Um, it's not a great game from him either. Did this gotta game st gotta stop fouling the shooter? Got to stop fouling the shooter. That was, yeah. That was, yeah. Reed foul followed on like multiple threes in this one too. Right. Yeah. Might not, that was yeah. uncharacteristic for Reed, but Very. Rob, that's been a theme for Rob all season. I'm surprised he hasn't. Yeah. And I think up. like, I think weirdly the fact that Rob has had more bad games, like got him a little bit more of a pass on this one. <laughs> like I, maybe I'm nuts, but like, I feel not like, agree. Fact, yeah. Like, I feel like the fact that like Rob, like you just kind of know you get the good and the bad, like where it's Reed's been more consistent, but I think is just like a, a little, I, I guess, less scoring dynamic that like people just don't anticipate it as much with him, but uh, yeah, bad, bad game for both of them. Um, did it move you one way or another, or are you just kind of like, we've got this whole sample and it, it is what it is. Oh, I, I'm always going to lean on the sample. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is a team wide failure. I, 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 we can, we can point out what each player kind of struggled with in that game, but everyone in that game struggled for Kentucky. Uh, I just thought that, you know, every freshman was playing with nerves 
everything they tried to execute, things that worked the whole season, that just that extra 10% of, of lesser precision is enough for you to get upset in the NCAA tournament, especially when Golki has mm-hmm. this insane performance. Uh, so, you know, I, I think was, at first it was a little bit of rough play to start from freshman with some nerves, and then it was just team-wide. Everyone was just playing out of their element, not comfortable. And, you know, that reverberates the whole team. You're going to see poor performances from a lot of different guys when the whole team is nervous about getting upset rather than playing with confidence. You know, we have a large yeah. sample of them being one of the best teams in the country. I'm going to lean on that. And I'm going to lean on the performances from when they were playing better competition where they looked better, uh, personally. Uh, at the same time, if I'm, I don't want to put blame on any one player from this game, like I mentioned, team-wide. But I thought everyone had their struggles, but I do think this loss reflected the issue that Cal Perry refused to shorten his rotation at the end of the year. And, you know, when you're running just these variety of lineups, some of which you haven't really run for very many minutes during the regular Mm -hmm. season in the NCAA tournament, that's going to throw people off even more when there's not comfort level from that chemistry. Yeah. well, the, like, the one that killed yeah. me too, that like wasn't even a rotational thing, was like benching Reed and then throwing him back in to like take a three with 20 seconds left. Like that yeah. was wild. Like his confidence is shattered. He's playing terrible. And then you bench him and then to be like, all right, we need to, we need to clutch bucket right now. <laughs> Crazy move. Crazy move yeah. to try to pull that one out. I was stunned and, by that. And, you know, like DJ Wagner statistically has been struggling over the last month and a half or so. You, it's why aren't Rob and Reed starting to set the tone for the game, right? You know, mm-hmm. if, if if you're setting this kind of like nervous energy into the game before they even see the floor, as freshmen, it's tough. You know, yeah. this isn't an exclusive issue to Kentucky. Freshmen, by and large, struggle in the NCAA tournament once things, once defenses clamp up and the margins are smaller. You know, the older players tend to tend to win out, and you know that's why one and done led teams don't often win the championship. Uh, so it shouldn't be treated as a Kentucky issue exclusively. This happens every year with freshman laden teams. Take it as take, take your notes as what you thought the struggles were for each player. And I certainly will accept those criticisms, but I am still going to lean on my assessment from the regular season. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I think there were still a, a lot of weird schematics. Well, like even like the week before the game, there was a Cal quote too, about how like, he wanted to go bigger and like some of this, like it, oh, it was, man. it was just, I was like, <laughs> now it's not the time to be tinkering. And, and the stuff to be tinkering with is not this, like it's very, very surprising. Uh, Clemson just beat Baylor. Shout out to Clemson. That's an upset. I didn't see coming. Good for them. Not uh, into that either. Yeah. So we are going to uh, take a quick break. And then on the other side, we've got a lot of guys to get to still. So stick with us. We will be right back. All right, let's talk about some Oregon Ducks because Oregon has been a fun surprise team. They're they're out, but they uh, pulled off an upset, had a really great game with Creighton that was down to the wire. Um, and Folly Dante, I think he's becoming a guy that I might uh, get a little too carried away with. He's a guy I've been watching. <laughs> I watched him a, a good amount this year. Um, he's, I've, I've been really interested in KJ Simpson. Or, uh, I'm sorry, KJ Evans. Uh, but as uh, Dante came back, KJ Evans' role kind of got smaller. Uh, but I think Dante has been really tremendous down the stretch. So he's a fifth year guy. He's had some injury woes over the years, but he's six foot 11 with an NBA body. And then in those two tournament games, 23 points, six boards, two blocks, and two steals against South Carolina. They get Creighton 28 points, 20 boards, uh, six, <laughs> two steals, two blocks. Crazy. Just ridiculous. I get it. He's kind of boring. Like this is a fifth year senior who is like a little bit scheme versatile, but not like, you know, he's not bam out of bio. Like, <laughs> like he's, he's a big guy who, who moves his feet really well in space. Like he's got those kind of soccer player feet. He rebounds really well. He's like an okay passer. Who's not like a real short roll threat. He has no range on his shot. He just finishes. He protects the rim. He can guard out in space. I really like him. Like, I think every team needs a center like this on their bench. And 
I don't know, like just like guys that like if you can use the sense like you can go to war with insert player here, like that's just a guy I tend to overrate mm-hmm. on my board. Like, and I feel like last yeah. the guy I felt this way about was Seth Lundy. Like Seth Lundy was just like, it's good to have a guy like that on your team. And I feel like that's where I'm at with Infali Dante. I get that he's not gonna step out to the three point line. I get that there's injury concerns. But I also, like, I feel like every year we do this whole thing where we're like, ah, oh, injury concerns, injury concerns. And a lot of times these guys just end up being fine because NBA teams have really good medical staffs. Um, I think he's like a really reasonable second round pick at this stage. Uh, yeah. How, how are you feeling with, with Dante? Well, first of all, I, I, you mentioned he's a boring player. He's a boring prospect, right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, his projection to the NBA is not very complicated, mm-hmm. but as a player, he's just so fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the joy that he plays with, like you said, you want to root for a guy like that. It's so easy to just like see that his teammates love playing with him. I've heard he's just an outstanding human being. Uh, and the amount of adversity that he's fought through with those major, major lower body injuries. And, you know, even in the way the style he plays with, he gets a little minor injury here and there every game. It feels like, <laughs> yeah, I, I want to just read through. I, I wrote down his last eight box scores from the field. All right. Mm-hmm. 12 of 20 from the field versus Creighton. That's his worst field goal percentage. I'm about to say seven and nine that. versus South Carolina, 12 and 12 against Colorado in the championship game. Five and seven against Arizona, eight and eleven UCLA, eight and nine Utah, ten and ten Colorado, eight and eleven Arizona. Over that stretch, seventy nine percent from the field. I mean, <laughs> good numbers bonkers. against good competition. Like that is, yeah, that is what you want to see. I mentioned Arizona twice in there. You know, two tournament games, championship game. I mean, he's he's playing the best of his whole career at the best time for his draft stock. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you know, it's it's a simple pitch, but it it works. I do think. While he does have that mobility in space, I would like his decision making in space to be a bit better. Mm-hmm. He did give up that uh, Cockbrenner dunk on a lob from Shireman at the end of a shot clock yesterday. That was pretty rough. Uh, it was a great pass by Shireman, but yeah, it was a bit mm-hmm. rough that he was not in position to defend that. You'd like to see him just be a, in the right position more often to make the right play instead of having to recover with his athleticism. But man, the energy he plays with, I mean, he'll die for loose balls, he'll destroy you on the boards. He'll energize the whole team with like highlight dunks and just, you know, having a guy like that in the locker room is great for a team. So for me, I would love to have a guy like that in the second round. Um, yeah. And, you know, injury concerns, I completely understand them. And that's why we would never discuss them in the first round, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, in the second round, injury concerns don't matter that much. You just want someone who makes your roster. Yeah. Uh, so I think he makes a roster. Yeah, that's all there is really to it. And like, I just think about like bigs that have been drafted in the last couple of years. I, I just feel like he stacks up really well compared to like a a Christian Coloco who's unfortunately had like medical issues, but like Musa Diabate who was just like super raw, or like Adama Sinogo who just like I, I watched him play Windy City Bulls game like a close couple weeks ago. Like he's really good in the G League, but he just doesn't have that NBA size. Like. I, I think he stacks up really favorably to a lot of players. And like we talked about the Grizzlies earlier, like I think about a guy like Trey Jemison, who's earned a two way for them. And it's just one of those guys where it's like, there's clear NBA size and he is just more than content to do the dirty work. Like he is a large man that will screen and will rebound and will dunk and will not try to do anything beyond what he's good at doing. And those guys like end up getting contracts. And like, I, I just think Dante is going to be a, a really solid NBA player for a long time. And maybe he's a guy that is a little bit deeper down your bench, but I, I, I think it's like completely reasonable to imagine him being like an everyday player. If, as long as everything holds up physically, look at the Lakers. Like they, they mm-hmm. tried to sign three different guys to fit, to have a second rim runner next to AD. They just tried to sign three guys to figure out, can any of these guys be the secondary lob threat next to AD? Uh, you know, teams really value this role off the bench and mm-hmm. we'll give contracts to players who can execute it. I, I think in a very simplified role, he can do it. Uh, it's just a matter of can his defensive reads be tight enough that you know he's better than his competition for those roster spots. Absolutely. I, I think that's a, a great point. Um, let's let's talk Jermaine Cuisinart real quick, because that's <laughs> yeah. another guy that like just cooked all of a sudden. He's had a really good counting numbers here. Like, I thought going to the tournament, he was probably a guy that was going to get into Portsmouth just because he's been really productive in a good conference. Mm-hmm. Um, dropped 40 in the first tournament game, uh, along with six assists. And then in the next game, 32 points, eight rebounds, and three assists. 
Did get the 32 points on 33 shots, though. Worth worth mentioning. <laughs> Not the some, cleanest. Some of those, some of those were those that overtime where he kind of lost his legs. Yeah. To be fair, yeah. but yeah, it was a For lot sure. of shots. It was a 50 minute game, so <laughs> so stuff happens. Um, but on the year, he scored 16.6 points per game. Not the most efficient. Like one of those guys who's just sort of like you're the only guy that we can really have score it on the perimeter, especially like during the time before Shellstead was like back and healthy. Um, mm-hmm. So 40, 35, 75 splits, 3.3 assists per game. Uh, he, he does some decent stuff defensively. I, I think he's just one of those guys that's in that like dreaded, not quite wing category, right? It's six, four. Yeah. Like he's not really guarding up the decision-making. Like he's got his moments. Like he, he is so tough and he's got like, enough wiggle and dribble craft to get inside a good amount and like when he is keeping his head up in those situations like he's he's good he's got like this super strong upper body when he punishes the low help and he's like willing to drive and do that and the shot is falling like he looks good the problem is just like he's very isaiah brockington like he's just very like (laughs) that's you know what i mean like it's just very like this type of guy doesn't usually play on an NBA team. Um, is that too harsh or do you think that's kind of reasonable? No, he's definitely going to have to earn his way in the G League. If, if, the, if he's trying to make the NBA, he, he needs to go the G League route first and prove that, first of all, he can get his efficiency up against, you know, that level of competition. Uh, and then, you know, 55 shots in two college games is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you could guess it, but you, you had the box goes up, but 55 yeah. shots in two games is nuts. <laughs> it's crazy. And it's, yeah. and, and it's not a regular thing for him, obviously. Two over, no. And it's not even just that there was a two overtime game in there. Like, it was, he had a lot of shots going into the end of regulation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he kind of flipped his narrative, I think. If you're seeing him for the first time, you might think that he's more of a perimeter oriented guy, but he, he really, he takes per, he shots on the perimeter, but hasn't really been that efficient from there his career and way more of a downhill Mm -hmm. guy creating gravity um has never really been too efficient his entire time of course Mm -hmm. you know in his role it's tough to be efficient at times but it's never really been efficient in in five years he is a fifth year senior yeah um and i think he had a you know you're in there too so i think he's like really yeah he yeah redshirted initially at south carolina it looks like okay yeah so you know you have to take that in consideration teams are definitely going to know that teams are going to be aware of that and gonna ask him to try and prove himself i think these two games might have gotten him in exhibit 10 yeah, um i think so which is perfectly fine for you know an older player who needs to prove his way he has that opportunity now probably which is great for mm-hmm. him and happy yeah. for him i am too yeah it's really cool to like see a guy like that just like i don't know it's one of those guys that's in sort of a a tough spot position like put themselves over the top and just say hey yeah like i'm i'm worth investing in a little bit and Hopefully he goes to the G, the shot gets a little bit better, and then the decision making can come along. Cause like we've seen guards that are able to just sort of slowly process the game a little bit better playing in the G League. And I, I think that's kind of the hope for him. Um, we are going to move tournaments uh, for a little bit here. Let's talk some NIT. And this is not going to be our last NIT guy either. Uh, but Peyton Sanford at Iowa, boy, oh boy, did he cook against Kansas State. This was a phenomenal game. He dropped, uh, I believe 33 or 30, uh, 30, 30 points against Kansas state. Uh, which is a team that has like good, big physical wings, like Arthur Kaluma, um, 30 points and 12 boards, seven of 11 from the three point line. Crazy. So I was still in the NIT mix. Uh, but Sanford, just a guy that like, I feel like every time I watch him, I, I feel like I'm a little bit lower on him than I should be compared to some of the other wing shooters in this class. He's six seven with like a real degree of strength to his game. Like I think he's listed around like two fifteen. Uh, so he's not like one of these stick thin shooters that's going to come in and get pushed around. And I think it's it's aided by the fact that he does rebound and he's a really clever passer. He's got a two to one assist to turnover ratio. Um, one of those guys where the shot always looked really good, but the numbers just like weren't quite there. Now he's up to almost thirty nine percent, um, three point twelve per hundred possessions, which is stellar. Um, not like the best on ball defender and like a little bit heavy footed, but I think he's a guy that displays really good balance and awareness when he has to rotate and move off the ball defensively. Um, I don't know. Like I, I look at a lot of the shooters in this class and 
I feel like there's a lot of guys that are just sort of in this similar range. And I think Sanford doesn't maybe get the love that he deserves uh, when you compare him with like the Caravans and the Shiremans and like the DeVrieses and all those guys. Um, what did you make of the, the Kansas State performance and how are you feeling about him as a whole? Yeah, so I would I would note that last year's shooting numbers were hurt a little bit by uh, he had like a weird injury that he was playing through and an illness that kind of tampered his three point numbers. But he's been so consistently like above ninety percent from the line, mm-hmm. and you just see from the way that the t- team runs its offense when they're when they're actually cooking that they that everything's designed to get Sanford open. I mean, they just want him taking as many threes in a game as he possibly can. This was the game where. It really popped off where their strategy really worked. I thought the ball movement in this game was really great for Iowa. Um, I thought that I timed his first three-point shot that after for how long it took to come off his hands because it was so instant. Yeah. It was at 0.4 seconds from hand on the ball to go, ball going up. And, and like 0.5 is and, crazy. Like 0.5 and, is nuts. To get 0.4 yeah. is. And and did you and he, did, were there any changes to his form? His form was immaculate. Yeah. Right. Uh, for ref. By the way, if you want a crazy Steph Curry statistic, because I looked mm-hmm. this up, he shoots 0.4 seconds from three from 30 feet. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's. How do you like? I feel like you could just put like a 700 pound dumbbell in his wrist and he could just like curl it to like have that sort of strength. He probably does that in workouts. Like, I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> you hear about the workouts that he does? If you've never heard about it, look it up. Oh my god. Um. But yeah, but yeah, that's like a huge part of the sell with him, though, is that like the ball is not in his hands long, zero dip on that thing. And like no. he's one of those guys where like the shot prep footwork is beautiful. Like he he just like his whole body goes into like a stop motion, like the second he catches the ball and then it's just up and it's out and it's clean and it's pretty. Um, I really love how he shoots the ball. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I, I just feel like there's a much stronger like this year case then people are giving you credit for, for a guy that's scoring like 17 a game on 45, 39, 90 is the leading scorer of a big 10 team. Like I, I think Peyton Sanford's really good. Yeah. I think, I think his form is just so easily repeatable uh, and so clean. He can get off movement. He can get it off catch and shoot. He can get it off the dribble. Uh, I do think he can continue to get better as a sidestep three guy as a, as a, you know, kind of those more complex, more difficult threes still growing in that area. Those are usually the ones that he misses at a higher clip than some of the games where he's in his like, per, like ideal form, but you know, mm-hmm. he does a great job push, pushing transition. I love to play in the first half where he, you know, got the rebound immediately threw the ball ahead and transition and then got rewarded with a trailer three. Mm-hmm. Um, he had that crazy shot where he was falling out of bounds at the end one. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh my gosh. What the, I had people texting me about that one. And, uh, yeah, he's just an incredible shot maker. Never stops moving. You think of, like, a Joe Harris. Why did Joe Harris Mm -hmm. win so many minutes in the NBA over other shooting prospects? It's that he never stops moving. He covers so much ground throughout the game. It's partly why Steph Curry is so incredible. Is Just he never stops moving. He never stops sprinting. Stanford, I think, can be that kind of player with just this incredible stamina where his shot just holds up throughout the game no matter how much he runs. And he just makes his defender miserable. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, 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 think, I love them. Yeah, and I think it's aided to like I, to me, it just like comes back to the passing. Where like a lot of the guys that have that like super movement skill set, where it's a lot of like run, 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 run. The passing is so often just like I'm on it, I'm off it. Where like with Sanford, like he's able to be a little bit more advanced than that. Like he's able to just see the floor a little bit better if he needs to have the ball in his hands for a longer period of time. Which like he's not a guy that needs to do that, but if he does, he sees the floor really well, can make some intermediate reads like. I, I think that in the rebounding is like the things that set him apart from just being like, Oh, it's just like a six, seven shooter. It's like, no, he's a six, seven shooter, but like there's real feel there's rebounding. There's, there's some impact in a level of feel that, that, that takes him over the top. Um, back to the NCAA tournament guys. Uh, Jackson Robinson uh, was another guy that had a big performance. I think it's actually kind of interesting to talk with, about him within the context of Peyton Sanford. Um because sure. I, I like Peyton Sanford a little bit better because of those things that we just mentioned. Uh, but Jackson Robinson, BYU lost in the opening round, but he had a, he had a great game. He had uh, 25 points. He was 5'11 for three. Should have been on the court more. Uh, again, just some kind of puzzling decision-making stuff. But again, like those, those things work all year. It was like, let's we bring him off the bench. We bring him off the bench. Um, 
probably shouldn't have been doing that. Uh, but he, he, he did he, say he, in the tournament, they did say on the broadcast, he asked to come off the bench this year. Okay, interesting. Okay, okay. I yeah. would have said uh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. What can you do? Yeah, so he, so he ends the year, he scored 14 a game on 42 35 90 splits. So again, we're talking about a guy who is uh you know high volume shooter but great free throw shooter less efficient overall than sanford i think a lot of that comes down to body um robinson is yeah. six seven and he's a guy that wears a t-shirt because he's really thin um not a rebounder <laughs> uh yeah defensive rebounding percentage below 10 um has like some moments as a decision maker but generally like a negative assist to turnover guy which is always a little mm -hmm. bit scary um especially when we're talking about a guy who he's a young senior but still he's a senior um we'd like to trust him a little bit more than that i think he does use his like length and quickness uh, pretty well on defense but again he's going to be one of those guys that comes into the league and is just really easy to drive through um yeah. and again like he got some craft at the rim but like a sub 42 percent uh or sub yeah like uh, a sub 43% field goal shooter, just because again, like there's not a lot you can do as a finisher when you're that thin. I've struggled with Jackson, Jackson Robinson a little bit uh, all year. He, he, his three point uh, willingness has always been there, but his percentage has never been great. And it's been a lot of like, his range is there. Like he can make really, really deep threes, but he's not a very dynamic shooter. It's still a lot of spot up. It's a lot of off the catch. Like, the movement numbers have never been great. Like he's 29% in transition, 26% as a pick and roll ball handler was 40% off screens, which is good. But like handoffs, 27%, like a guy like Ben Shepard was like 40 plus percent, like 42 mm -hmm. plus percent on all those kind of shots last year. And I think Shepard came in as a better decision maker, uh, a better defender. Like, I don't want to like dump on Jackson Robinson because I thought this is a really good game, but I saw a lot of people kind of putting the card ahead of the horse with him a little bit. And again, like this is a game where he has like two rebounds, like he just he doesn't do a whole lot outside of the shooting, and the shooting is great. Um, but the guys that are that size that kind of just shoot, I, I feel like are not really much of a thing anymore. A am I being too harsh, or, or what do you, what do you kind of make of, of Robinson? No. I asked a friend what he thought of Robinson. This of the guys we're talking about today. This is the guy who I've seen the first game of. This was my first game seeing him. Okay. And and I asked a friend about him, uh, and and he said, if you told me he was 19, I'd be very interested. Yeah. But he's yeah. a fourth year player who still has a skinny frame. Still, you know, the efficiency is is better this year, but it's never really been at that elite level. Mm -hmm. I mean, very willing shot taker, but you know, like you said, I don't think the form's like perfect like some of the other three-point specialists that we could talk about uh you know i, I don't like the handle personally no. um it, it's very loose i always say with like these like longer forwards longer wings with, when they have trouble they have kind of like that noodly handle or you just feel like the the arm the arm like like mm. you look at Ryan Dunn, who's not a good handler, but you at least know that the ball is pounding the floor in the same spot each time as he's going to the rim. With Jackson Robinson, it just feels like it's his handles are all over the place. And mm -hmm. when you're also already skinny and get bumped, that's really dangerous for yeah. handle. Mm -hmm. uh, so for me, I, I I would hope that he's like a three point specialist on my team if he if he's stuck on the roster. Uh, you know, he's not an Isaiah Joe type, right? Like Isaiah Joe has no. been an absurd shooter his entire career uh so that yeah, that's, that's all that's and you already see for. that Isaiah Joe had to really earn his way into the league the hard way so um to have a to have a guy who's got frame concerns shots not uh at the highest level for the NBA it's gonna be tough mm -hmm. but there's a chance there positional size and uh or you know his height and shooting combo is still desirable so he'll get a for shot sure. Yeah, I, th I think a lot of it is going to come down to like how he performs pre-draft. And like, yeah, I think the handle needs to tighten up. Um, but he is like, I, I don't know, like sort of a late bloomer in a sense, too. So I, I think maybe there is a hope that that stuff might be a little bit more correctable during the pre-draft process for him than it might be for other guys. Just because like, probably didn't get a whole lot of developmental attention. Like, he, like this is only like his second year playing major minutes um but yeah, yeah. I, just, I just worry a lot about like the body especially because of how narrow his shoulders are like he's not 
Like there are guys like Moses Moody that came to the league skinny, but it's just like his shoulders are so broad, like that dude's gonna fill out. And like I Jackson Robinson's just like not there for me. Yeah. Um I think he's got a COVID year if he wants it, and I kinda hope he takes it, is sort of my take on it. I mean, just for him in general, I think it's a better decision probably, unless, you know, a team yeah. really is willing to take it slow with him, which isn't common for fourth year guys. Mm-hmm. Um you know, we talked about with Neek, it's a fourth year explosion statistically. So you have to look at the previous, like, uh, the previous uh, years and figure out why he wasn't like this. This is my first game seeing him, so I haven't got down mm-hmm. to the science of how this happened. But with Neek, at least you can kind of explain it away a bit, which makes him a, a bit more of appeal and more appealing prospect than Jackson for me. Mm-hmm. We're going to take a, uh, a final quick break and then we're going to kind of breeze through some other guys. So stay with us here. All right, so let's do uh, some more quick hits. Let's do another NIT guy. Uh, Eric Reynolds had a big final outing for St. Joe's. Like I said earlier, I'm not I'm not a small guard guy. But when I watch Eric Reynolds, I'm like, man, this guy could take over a game. <laughs> uh, he had 27. It was on 22 shots. It was a much better first half than second half. Um, I I get the concerns with Reynolds because it's like he still is very much a hunts his own shot kind of guy. He uh is you know sub three assists per game another guy who like doesn't really rebound um but like he's got these really long arms and i kind of do like his frame like i do think he could fill out pretty well um he's gotten better at passing and cutting his turnovers every year i think there's a shot that like next year we're talking about eric reynolds is like a potentially draftable prospect is that a reach or is that just like, yeah, maybe, I guess, who cares? <laughs> like, I, yeah. what, What's your temperature with Eric Reynolds? I think I'm already there that he's draftable. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. So for me, it's like he's in the KJ Simpson lane again. It's interesting that they're both brought up because he's a guy who came in, into the into college is really an undersized combo guard to the fullest extent, you know, where he's being he's being played at point guard, but he's not really a point guard. I mean, he's just a shot maker. I, I, I'm more forgiving of his uh proclivity to shooting w- w- every time he gets the ball because the team knows he's the best shot maker on the team it's a little more explainable in the a10 that you know he's just going to dominate the shots because he's this incredible shot maker um he has a really beautiful repeatable pull up jumper from the mid range i think he's just a mid range maestro uh i think it's not as repeatable when he's it's a little dicier when he stretches it out deeper on the court you see that kind of like signature leg kick that he has get a little bit more pronounced. It's not as like uniform shot to shot, but I think he's an outstanding shooter uh, and an improved passer. I, I think that, you know, he plays next to Xavier Brown, who maybe we could mention yeah, here. As yeah, a he's interesting. Yeah. Future guy, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, you know, really bursty, like more traditional point guard. Uh, also undersized, so not your cup yeah. of tea, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh I, I don't know what I think about him yet, but I, I, I was enjoying his performance there. Playing He's next good. to him, he doesn't have as much playmaking responsibility as last year. So while his assist numbers are still not great, I think in that context, having an actual point guard next to him, it's actually a pretty nice improvement. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. He's like a second round pick for me, I think, if he if he came out, but not a pr- high priority guy. Uh, like if, if you're an NBA team and you're ranking out your guys, you're probably ending up offering him a two-way rather than truly considering drafting him. Sure, but, uh, sure. Yeah, you're not giving him like a four year out of the gate. But he's on your board as someone to track after the draft to make sure that you can scoop him up. Mm-hmm. Um, let's do the Washington State guys discussion. They, so they had a great yeah. game against Drake. Um, we'll kind of skip over the Drake side of it because it sounds like uh, Tucker Reese is going to be staying in school and following his dad to Washington or uh, West Virginia, rather. Uh, so let's talk about the West Virginia or the, ah, man, I'm all <laughs> Washington state guys. So they've got three guys that we think are, are like kind of interesting to, to various degrees. So Jalen Wells, uh, who I interviewed, check that out on our podcast feed. Uh, it was like two weeks yeah, ago. I love that. Recent, recent and fresh. Um, he is your like six, eight score, like 41% from three rebounds pretty well. Good decision maker can put it on the floor a little bit, really struggles on the interior, like very thin, uh mm-hmm. body and then you've got isaac jones who's like six nine but like almost 250 like big strong interior defender cleanup guy finisher rebounder and then miles rice six two freshman 
uh, redshirted, had a, a really serious health battle that he's managed to overcome. Really good table setter. Like another one of those guys where it's like, man, he seems fun to play with. Like really high energy, was giving it to the crowd, was taking it from the crowd and giving it right back. Yeah. Uh, just sort of like your your standard like point guard that your dad would love. Uh, mm-hmm. is how I would describe Miles Rice's game. <laughs> so out of those three, like how would you kind of rank them and, and assess them at this stage? Well, first of all, it's another team I really want to root for. I don't know if this is my West Coast bias mm-hmm. showing through, but I've been really rooting for these guys like the Nevali Dantes, the Washington States, because every Pac-12 team this year felt like everyone wanted to like put down going into this tournament, and the Pac-12 is doing great. I think they're six yeah. and one, six and two. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Well, I think Colorado just lost. Colorado so lost. Six and yeah. Two. Um, but it, you know, it, I, I really enjoyed watching him. Um, pers- uh, watching the team personally. I think Jalen Wells is is that shooting profile is the first thing that draws your attention, mm-hmm. and I think I think we agree that all three of these guys are talking about is like maybe second rounders, maybe guys Portsmouth guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jalen Wells' shooting profile is really interesting. Did he transfer up from was it D two or JUCO? He was at a Sonoma. He was at Sonoma State, which was like right. A, so I think I'm higher on Wells. Like Wells is to me like a guy that I I would like have on my combine advice if i was NBA team like yeah the combo, i think like, it's fair camp. Like, I, th- I think he's super interesting just because he's that size and he was a late bloomer and like played really well in conference play like no you're right he's at I, least I, a, a little combine guy minimum yeah mm-hmm. um but let's talk so yeah so wells is like I, I think pretty clearly like good and like a real prospect i think jones and rice are kind of interesting because jones i think is out of eligibility this year if i'm not yes. mistaken um Yes. What do you make of him? Because he's like six foot nine. So he's not center size. He's not a great passer. He can't shoot, but you watch games and it's just like, Oh, he's like, he's really good. Like he's just, he's yeah. clearly like a pain to play against and has a lot of energy and makes stuff happen. Uh, what, yeah. like, do you think he's going to get like a, an E10? Like, I, is he a summer league invite? Like where does he settle into things? I think, I think E10 is probably most likely maybe a team gets really enamored, gives them the two way, but I think E10 is probably the safe, safe zone for projection. Um, he's six. You mentioned he's six, nine, two, like two fifty. Mm-hmm. Interestingly, like most of his bulk is in the upper body. I, I think did he actually weirdly, like when you see him play against, um, who they lost to, I'm blanking here. Uh, when they lost to Iowa state, they were getting uh, back down. He was getting back down pretty easily by some of the uh, the, the forwards on that team, not necessarily NBA sized forwards, uh, and pushed around a little bit. I, I think that it's be- partly because he's so strong in the upper body that helps him offensively, but then his lower body strength help that uh, hurts him defensively. Um, so it's a bit difficult to project in the NBA just because it's kind of a weird sell. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to already try to th- be creative with him right away because of his kind of weird tweener position p- positionality. But I love his offensive game. He's got a lot of craft. Uh, he can score on you in a lot of different ways. He's he's a pest. And, you know, he's really, really long. So Yeah, he, he is. So he, if, if he can get the right position on you uh, – when the pass comes into the in the block, he can definitely impose you at the rim. He can definitely impose his will on a de- on an offense, but it just has to be the right fit. And I don't know how many teams are going to go out of their way to look for that fit. Yeah. Uh, so just a quick heads up. My uh, my daughter's here in the last diaper change of the night in the background right now, and she's being a little <laughs> noisy. So we're we're almost at potty training phase. So once that's done, I, I she'll make far less appearances on the podcast. But I think I think what you mentioned with Isaac Jones is really interesting. He does look super long. And I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Like I think this is going to be one of the bigger measurement years that I can recall. Where like mm-hmm. if he's a guy that comes in and measures with like a seven three wingspan, I think suddenly teams are going to be like we can stomach it. Like if he has enough wingspan and standing reach to like b- take up center size measurements on an NBA court. Uh, right. I think there might be some real interest there. I think that's going to be the big thing for him. I think rice is a guy that's just like a couple years away. Like the shots just not there yet. Defensively. He's not yeah. enough. Like it's just going to be a kind of a wait and see timing thing. Yeah. You see the building blocks, you know, coming off a of significant illness, you know, maybe he can mm-hmm. add more to his frame than what we've seen. For sure, uh, quick, yeah. Quicker, quicker than another guard might, who's you know already been in the system for years. Um, yeah, I just want to see a little bit more next year. Um, see what he can do. I, I love the building blocks, at least. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I do too. Um, I, I I did love it. 
Isaac Jones had this like crazy aggressive dunk attempt in the second second half against Drake. Like he he was just being used as a key like mismatch exploit guy, and was just mm-hmm. dominating that game in a way that I hadn't seen this year. So it's really fun to see him show out in the tournament as a fifth year guy who's trying to make a statement. Yeah, and I think he, like the fact that he like was the guy that I think was either like a, he was also like a JUCO or low, lower level guy too, if I'm not mistaken. He played at Idaho. I don't know if he yeah um, and, and yeah. I, I think like maybe he spent one year somewhere that. else. Yeah. Yeah. So I yeah, hopefully and like maybe that's something too. Like maybe there is like a real trajectory for him because of that. Um let's just real quick hit on a couple other guys that, that had big outings today. I haven't hit like didn't really get to like fully digest these games. Like Jared McCain went off for Duke and like, I've watched that game like on my phone while cooking Mongolian beef, which is like not my ideal film setup, believe it or not. Like it's usually best to not be operating like a walk while you're uh, watching a game on a phone. But uh, McCain had 30 points, uh, eight for 11 from three. Like this dude is like, clearly a really good shot maker and like can rebound and has a level of physicality and toughness in that's desirable for a small guard but he is so off the ball in this role because the other guards kind of need to play on the ball because they don't have that off ball skill set um where where are you seeing jared mccain at this point like do you think this is a tougher role fit or do you think like he's just good enough at, at this that like he can he can find a spot I think the size matters for sure. Again, you know, I've been talking, I've been the bigger fan of the smaller guards, I think so far this episode, but I still am always going to temper my expectations at that height. He, he definitely have a shot, has a shot. I mean, if he can hit I, yeah, shots. I think he really does. Like it, it, to a real degree. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, like he might be a dude. Yeah. I mean, just the shot making is incredible for his age and just the poise that he plays with. I, I personally predicted that he would be the best Duke freshman coming into the year. I feel great about that. I didn't expect this. I mean, I, I thought the, the efficiency that he's scoring with is just awesome and already looks like he knows how to manage a game. I've, I've loved his season. I didn't catch the game today, uh, hmm. but I've really loved what I've seen from him. What? I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw a, a wild one at you. Like, what percent chance do you think there is that he like makes an all-star game? Oh, wow. Cause like, I don't, I don't think it's like zero, but I don't know that it's higher than like five. You know what I mean? Like, like I, yeah. I, I think it's pretty okay. unlikely. Like I think it's generally unlikely, but I was scared. I was going to hear a crazy number. Cause no, I'm, I'm always no. the more, uh, I, I'm, I'm always more like moderate with my guesses. Why? Well, and I think with that too, like, unless like they change the number of players in an all-star game, like there's yeah. like, like Mikhail Bridges, you know what I mean? Like, like okay, let's, let's, really let's cha- go make an all-star game. So, let's like, change it like this. He gets drafted to an Eastern conference team. What's his chance? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So like if we go through the Eastern conference, like I, like it just, it gets really tricky real quick. Cause it's like, is he better than like true holiday and Derek white? You know what I mean? Is he better than Damian Lillard? Probably not. Der- is he better than Darius Garland? At some point. No. Probably not. Yeah. I, I, I the the the, all, the Garland All Star season like, in particular was just so that's true. awesome. Yeah. Yeah, because like he's he's not like as Garland's not as bulky, but like he is just like so far ahead as a passer, like even at the same age. Um right. Yeah, I mean Orlando. He's probably better than all of Orlando's guards. So he's probably not better than Brunson. Like this is like the tricky part with projecting guards. Is like you just go through the list of like who the starting guards are, and it's like, oh man, like there's just a lot of good ones. Um, yeah, he's probably not an all-star. I, yeah, five percent is probably too high. Um, yeah, but I, I do think there's a real chance that he could not be non-zero. Yeah, right. Non-zero. I, yeah. I think he's. I do think he's got a really good chance to start. I. I, I am a little concerned about him being pretty below the rim like not a guy that blocks many shots and also Mm -hmm. just it's tough to know what he looks like in a more on ball roll like that's gonna be a guy that like i watch like every pick and roll possession and like go through like the zapruder film to try and figure out like what's actually there yeah and it's like what how, how effective he is effective but how effective is he outside of the perimeter game right Mm -hmm. like how far does this go uh, that that yeah. that's my kind of my big question and why I'm probably gonna have him more in the same range as like a KJ Simpson probably. Mm-hmm. Um, that's gonna be an interesting debate for me in my head that I haven't had yet. So I think I think I like McCain more because I just think he's like physically. Age definitely matters better. here too. Yeah. Two yeah. year difference, right? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, a couple years younger. I do think I think McCain's actually a sneaky old freshman, though, if I'm not mistaken. Like I think he maybe it's more like a year and a half. Then. Mm-hmm. Um, let's uh, real quick. Like Tyler Kolick was great uh, today. I think he had like a 25 and five or something. <laughs> like crazy, crazy game from him. While we're on the small guard front, like let's throw him out there too. Like you think with Kolek, like, like the passing is good enough to be a signature skill, and do you think he's athletic enough to be able to deploy it successfully in the NBA? Oh wow, yeah, I, I think the athleticism is pretty much the one and only question for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you get an answer for that at summer league, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like there aren't a lot of guys who answer questions for you at summer league. But he might be one of those guys where it's like, does he belong here? He belonged against his college contemporaries this whole time. I would assume mm-hmm. he will. But does he belong enough to just be able to slide into a bench unit right away? Um, I think the answer is yes. I, I've always been higher on Tyler Kolek than I think others. And I think the consensus has moved past me a little bit on Kolek, where you know he is, at the end of the day, still always going to be a bench guard for me. I don't think he ever has any starter projection. Yeah, I agree um, and, and with that in mind, you're always going to moderate how high you have him. But as a backup point guard, I'm all, all I'm all for it. I mean, I haven't seen a passer of this quality in the college game in a long time. If you start incorporating things like Sharif Cooper's downhill ability incorporated into his passing ability, then you start having some arguments. But in terms of just like pure mm-hmm. craft, it's, it's, it's unmatched for me over the last few years. So I'm a huge Kolek fan. Shout out my George Mason guys. Do you want to hear a crazy portal portal thing? Let's do it. Yeah. If George Mason, if there was no portal, if there was no transferring, George Mason this year would have Tyler Kolek, uh, Xavier Brown from Southern Illinois, and Josh Aduro. I mean, that's a tournament team oh, right there. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, because I saw Aduro play from them yeah. last year in person, and it was just like, that dude's a force. Like, I, that's the guy that like I think like Sneaky is going to get more looks than people expect just because like he's as big as a house, and people just like yeah. bounce off of him. Like loved watching a George so Mason. Physical. Yeah. Loved watching a Providence. But also, let's say they just stayed at school and the portal was open. They all adding Keyshawn Hall into the mix. And it's just yeah. like a cra- crazy roster. But, mm-hmm. you know, portal does portal things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So shout out my guy. I'm always going to advocate for him because of that. I, I went to George Mason. Uh, but yeah, I-, I-, I love his game. Definitely draftable. Definitely like end of first round consideration in a draft like this is the way I would put it. For sure. Yeah, I think I think that's more than reasonable. Uh, last guy, we're, we'll go opposite of the small guard talk. Zach Eady um, had oh, wow. a monstrous game today. Uh, what's your Zach Eady take? Because like I've always felt like if nothing else, he'll be like, a really solid like bench player that like you just throw in for a change of pace and can dominate. I think there's like a non-zero chance that he's like really awesome. Um, I don't think there's like a chance that he's like absolutely terrible. Like I, I just no. I just don't think he's gonna be. Uh where do you rank a guy like that though? Like where there's gonna be like real scheme limitations? Cause like the thing that scared me the most when I did my deep dive on him for a column earlier this year was just like the pick and pops are terrifying. Like they're mm-hmm. when teams pick and pop him, it's scary. And I there are other people I've talked to that are like worried about like even just how he defends ball screens at the NBA level, like how he defends with defensive three seconds at the NBA level. I think if defensive three seconds goes away, like maybe he's a cheat <laughs> code. But then again, with so many teams, like, oh, man. there's just so much philosophy stuff that goes into this. Because like you've also got so many teams playing five out that like if defensive three seconds goes away, does do you even want to keep a big man in the paint? Does that even make sense? Um, really interesting guy. Uh, but like, do you have any like any quick thoughts that you're able to to string together on him? I'm going to cop out so hard right now. I have sure. purposely been not deciding this yet. Great. <laughs> I, I like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's like, I, I, I want to just like, I've watched every prospect who ha- who's more typical. And then at the end of the year, mm-hmm. I love just tackling the guys who are really complicated at the end. Uh, and he's a guy who I, I'm taking in games. I'm watching them now, but I'm like kind of waiting to really formulate my opinion. I, my question for you is, how many minutes do you think he can handle in the NBA in an ideal scenario? So I, I was actually just thinking about this the other day because initially I'd been a bigger, like more than you think kind of person because he does play so many minutes at Purdue. Like he is in really good shape for a guy his size. Like he he's played over 30 minutes a game the last couple of years. And Purdue isn't like 
the most plotting team in the world. Like, I don't know if their pace numbers in front of me, but like, they're not like a super low possession team. No, they'll run transition. Uh, they'll they'll run up tempo. They'll look for the easy look if they can get it. Yeah, like I, I think. What does Zubak play? Like twenty four. You know what I mean? Like twenty eight. Like I, I think he's probably closer to like that type of big. I've heard that name before. Yeah. Um. Yeah, Zubak plays twenty six a game this year. Like I think it's probably something like that. Like I don't. And, think... and on a different team that doesn't like playing small lineups, maybe he plays more. Zubac. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think I think that's reasonable. Yeah, because he's not like a guy who seems exhausted when they pull him out. Mm-hmm. Uh. Yeah, I, I think I think he could maybe scratch 30 if, if you think about it in that context. I'm really interested to see just like what more an NBA team can get out of him athletically. Like given that he's still like newer to basketball uh, and like appears to have a great work ethic. I, I think that's like the most interesting thing. It's like if you can just avoid if he can because like I think about Zubak in terms of like the pick and pop stuff a lot where like Zubak is not a good pick and pop defender. But with Edie having so much wingspan, it's like if he's. 85% of Ivica Zubak is a closeout defender. <laughs> like he is suddenly a good NBA starting center. Yeah. It's, it's all just like, what, how, how far can we crank this? Basically? How, how can we get yeah. the most out of him while minimizing what he doesn't do well? And mm-hmm. it's going to, I'm just so interested by the theory crafting and so interested to start doing it even more once we figure out which team he's on. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. If he's playing 30 minutes a night and he's pouring it in and, you know, he's one of your higher up offensive options, he's a positive player at that point. I mean, if he's able to handle that minute load, it, it, he's a positive player. And then you talk about just the idea of that kind of mismatch existing that you can craft around makes him super valuable. And it's, it's a guy you have to take high, but you have to reach that conclusion first that you think that that's what's going to happen. Yeah, and I I think especially, like, the passing is something we need to kind of highlight with him. Because I I think a lot of people that are sort of, like, we get a lot more people that that listen to the podcast around this time of year that are just dropping into the draft discussion, things like that. And I think a lot of the perception of Edie is, like, guy who dominates because he's tall. And, and like, certainly it helps. It certainly (laughs) does not hurt. But I think, like, he does have a real level of, like, help recognition and rotation recognition that helps him a lot in the post as far as like just being able to make those quick dishes, punish double teams on a consistent basis, understand where the defenders are going next so that he can make a little bit more than just like passing it back to the guy who passed it into him. Like I I like how he feels the game. And I think that matters quite a bit too. Yeah. And I think I've gotten a perception from some people who maybe haven't watched as much Purdue this year. You know, some people don't like watching Purdue. I get it. I I, I like watching Purdue. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think there's some people who haven't seen him as much this year who have this perception that people are only moving him up in their rankings because it's a weaker draft. And that's not the case at all. He's gotten a lot better from when he first started Purdue to now. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely worth it if you haven't really watched a lot to turn it back, turn the games back on and see how much he's grown as a player, see how much more craft he has. Like, I mean, just one year ago, they lost to Fairleigh Dickinson. And while we can talk about guard play there as being a reason they lost, Edie had some responsibility there too. Mm-hmm. And, and this year, he's just looked so much more complete and and even more dominant than he already was when he was National Player of the Year last year. So, to to yeah. me, it's 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 disingenuous to suggest he's only scoring because he's tall. It, it's worth mm-hmm. watching. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think he's he's had a really nice season. Um, well, that that will do it, Garrett. Thank you so much for for coming on. You've been spectacular. It's it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Where can where can people find you and and follow you along with you on social media? Yeah, so uh, I have Twitter at Half Awake Takes, or my name, Garrett Johnson. Uh, starting to dip into the YouTube space, put out my first uh, long-form scouting report. They're, they're run more like 10 minutes compared to some of, like, some of the shorter quick hit ones on YouTube. Got another one coming out this month. Probably going to release one to two a month. So definitely check that out and see if you like it and subscribe if you want to. Uh, yeah. Just want to mention how much I've always loved your content, Max. It's been great. Uh, and an awesome to be on the podcast now after years of sharing each other's stuff. For sure. Yeah. Always been a big fan of, of the work that you put out. So make sure you're following along with Garrett. Make sure you're following us at No Stillings NBA. I've got a column dropping tomorrow on Hunter Salas, uh, which should be out by the time most of you guys are listening to this. Uh, interesting player, like a guy I'm not like super high on, but I think is like clearly pretty good at basketball. Uh, and that's that's worth something. And then the draft at a certain point. So uh, definitely check that out. Cause I think a lot of his game gets sort of misunderstood. Like he was the guy when I dove into the tape, like I, 
I see things a little bit differently than I think a lot of the public is as far as like what his actual strengths and weaknesses are. Um, so go check that out. Um, make sure you subscribe to our podcast feed, subscribe to the Substack. follow me on Twitter at bound boards, follow at no ceilings NBA, and that'll do it. So thank you all so much for joining us. We'll see you all next week.